Thank you. Thank you, Creative Mornings team, for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So when the folks at Creative Mornings said, said that they wanted me to come speak on time, I thought, great. This is only the broadest topic in all the universe. <laughs> this is something that Sir Isaac Newton got wrong. This is something that Einstein spent years and years trying to figure out. This is something that's still one of the greatest questions alive. What is time? So my brain functions a little strangely. So when I ask myself, OK, what are the first things that I think of when I think about time? I think of these guys. Anybody know who that is? Hootie, Hootie and the Blowfish. Time was a great song. For some reason, that's how my mind works, um, strangely enough. And then my, my mind goes straight to these guys, um, Back to the Future. It's been a great year for them. Between hoverboards and, and the year that they traveled to, this is a big Back to the Future year. And then I started to ask people around me. I said, what is time? What does time mean to you? And beyond the people that looked at their watch, everybody kind of paused for a minute. And everybody started thinking of giving me sayings. Well, time, time is of the essence. Time is money. Time is this, it's that. And these are all great idioms. Time is of the essence, waste of time, right on time. And they'd fly through all these time sayings. I'd say, that's great. But the question still remains, OK, what is time? So at its simplest, time is a measurement. Right? So in the early days, it was about measuring celestial occurrences to tell us about what was going on. Right? So the sun rises and it sets, and that's a day. The moon has phases, and those are the weeks. The seasons come and go, and that tells us about the year. Next slide. And the most notable civilization that did this was the Mayan civilization. Now, the Mayans loved time. They're obsessed with time and with nature with celestial cosmic occurrences. And they were so obsessed that they built all these structures that would tell them when things were happening. They built specific structures to tell them the exact moment of the winter solstice. The sun would pass through a little hole in a building. And when that sun hit the hole just right, they knew it was the winter solstice. And they had another one for the summer solstice. Um, this is actually a, py a pyramid in Chichen Itza in Mexico. And this pyramid actually has 364 steps. And at the top, there's one more. So every day, the sun would shine differently on a different step. And this is how they knew the days of the year. Crazy. Um, and, but crazier than that is that they, had, they believed that they had to do sacrifices to help the sun move from when it rose in the east to when it set in the west. That it was their responsibility to move the sun across the sky. And quick side note that I love talking about the sun. So the sun's actually 93 million miles away. And it takes light eight minutes to go from the sun to when you see it. So when you look at the sun and you see that light shining, you're actually looking into the past, which is kind of mind boggling this early in the morning, but stick with me. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so while that's great for our day to day time, um, time, the length of time for a day actually has changed. So over the last 600 million years, the Earth's rotation on the axis has actually slowed down a little. Days actually used to be 22 hours long. Um, and so that, over the last 600 million years, changing that two hours is crazy. And the wind actually on a day-to-day -day basis today changes the length of a day Yes, by milliseconds, but the length of every day is actually different. Depending on the wind speed across the mountains, that friction occurs, and that friction slows the rotation of the Earth's axis. So depending on the wind speed, one way or the other, every day is actually longer or shorter by a couple milliseconds. So what did scientists do? Not going into this crazy thing. Don't worry, I kind of put this up facetiously. I don't have a physics degree. I can't tell you about like 99% of the things going on here, so don't worry. Um, but what I can tell you is that they came up with the atomic clock, right? So the atomic clock, very simply, is they took this crazy element called cesium, and they said cesium, uh, we have all these atoms with cesium, and every time 
uh, an electron jumps from one ring to the other, creates this, radi this radio frequency, not radio frequency, sorry, creates this uh, reverberation. And this reverberation happens at the same frequency. And it happens 9 billion times every second. And they use that element in atomic clocks. And that's the most precise time-keeping measurement in the world. And yeah, I, I didn't want to sound too much like the, the scientist from The Simpsons, but I, that's what I felt like explaining that. Um, yeah, next slide. <laughs> but that's great, but some people have difficulties agreeing on what year it even is, right? So to most of us, it's the year 2015, barely, by like three more weeks. Um, but in the Islamic calendar, it's 1437. And in the Jewish calendar, it's 5775. So where are we? Like, what, what, we don't even know what year it is. People can't even agree on this. So then there was this guy named Einstein. And Einstein did a lot of awesome stuff, right? But one of the awesome things that Einstein came up with was this theory of space-time. So he said that time is just the way that we measure matter going through space. And that time is the simple way that we can follow motion. So it's how we explain motion through the universe. And that space and time are actually together. They're married. There's an equal sign with other fun stuff in the equation, but there's an equal sign there. And so that created this concept of space-time, and that said that there's actually four dimensions, right? You can move up and down, left and right, forward and back, and we can move across in time, which is crazy. You can't move back in time yet, or forward in time yet, but it's all on this one plane. Now, getting away from Einstein a little bit, um, how do we actually perceive time? Right? So some people say, oh, I feel like that flew by. Or today I sat in class in time, it took forever. Um, so science has actually shown us that the more data we imprint on our mind, that the longer time we feel like takes. So as a kid, or when you're doing a new experience, you're imprinting all this data into your brain from new experiences that you're having. You're taking in the colors and the sounds and the feelings that's why if you go bungee jumping, it might feel like it's, you know, you did it for 30 seconds when it really lasted five seconds. Because you're falling, you're taking everything in, you're imprinting all of these tiny information points and you're putting them onto your brain. And that versus sitting on the couch and watching TV and something you've seen a gazillion times, that's why that time seems different. And obviously, along the span of your life, each year is making up a tinier and tinier amount. So when you're five, Seems like your next birthday is forever, right? It's a year is 20% of your life. But by the time you're in your 80s, it's barely, you know, just over 1%. So it's nothing. The five-year plan, once you're 80, it's like you sneeze and it's happened. Um, wait, go back. So um, if you can, that's okay. Um, but I'm no physicist. And you're all like, what is this guy up here rambling about science for? Um, I'm in business. Uh, so uh, as part of SpeedyTab, running a technology company, in business, time, to go back to idioms, time is money, right? So every second that you're doing something has value to it, and whether you're uh, like a worker behind a desk working hourly, or you're Warsaw coffee, making coffee, every second that you're doing something is valuable. Next slide. So, how are people actually spending their time every day? This is from uh, the Labor Statistics Bureau. Um, so actually, America works more than any other industrialized nation out there. Um, and they work more and more every year, which is scary. I definitely feel that. Um, I would like to work that much. Um, so the average American works almost nine hours a day. Sleep, we get a good amount, 7.7 .7 hours. Uh, but you can see the breakdown here. The craziest part to me is like all three meals that you eat combined for one hour. That's, everyone's just like chowing down like ridiculously fast. Um, next slide. So for us, man, so people are taking 20 minutes per meal that they're eating and, that, and snacks. I eat a lot of snacks. So uh, we looked at that and we looked at both sides of the equation for us, right? So we've got consumers, Mr. Businessman here. I wish 
for our graphic designers out, that, out there. I wish I could draw something like that, I can't. Um, and the merchants on that side. So for merchants, it's about inefficiency. It's about why is the way they're operating, um, why is that reducing how many customers that they can serve, how much product they can get out there, which gets into capacity and workflow. And for consumers, for this guy, this guy's time is really money because it's about opportunity costs. What else could he be doing right now instead of standing in line waiting for coffee? Well, he could be selling something worth a million bucks, he could be making giant deals, whatever it might be. So, we looked at the traditional ordering process, specifically within hospitality, so at coffee shops and bars and hotels and concessions and movie theaters where you're ordering and paying for something like why are there so many steps? You know, first the, it starts and they listen to you, say the order, and maybe ask them some questions about the menu. Um, then, all right, we're starting to make the items and we're going to serve the items. Then we're going to ask for you to pay for it. Then we're going to enter it into the point of sale. Then we're going to um, take your credit card and swipe that through. Then we're going to wait for the receipt printer. Then we're going to grab that receipt and put it in the little book. Then we're going to give you that book to you. Then you're going to sign it. Then we're going to take it back. Then we're going to put it in our stack. And then at the end of the night, we're going to count all those stacks and put it all together. It's crazy. So why do you do all this stuff? It creates a bad customer experience. So let's boil it down. Really, really, really easy. Just make the items. Give the items. That's it. And especially in hospitality, it's about customer experience. So how's that for customer experience? This is what you asked for. Here it is. Smile. How are you? Have a nice day. Um, and that's what we wanted to focus on. So where do we see this now, um, especially for us at Speedy Tab, where do we focus on these items? So we focus on these at coffee shops like Warsaw Coffee, shout out for the amazing breakfast again, um, with food trucks, which is another area where you see long lines, bars, quick service restaurants, performing arts centers, hotels. So think about this concept of a world without lines. Why do we have to wait in line everywhere that we go? Why do we have to wait in line at breakfast and at lunch and everywhere. It's, it's inefficient and it's a poor experience. So what we ask in business are, are these questions. Um, so if we can just save 45 seconds on every transaction, what is that going to do for, um, for consumers? And what is that going to do for businesses? How much more revenue can we drive for merchants out there? And how much of a better experience does that create for our customers? So this is kind of the flip of that. And I think the most important part is for most of us out there, all of us are consumers. And all of us just want to have an easy, frictionless, seamless experience wherever we go. And that means making the most efficient use of our time. So by really eliminating the extraneous you know, credit card swiping and inputting things into a point of sale and all those items, we can boil it down to what's important and maximize your time. So before I end, I just want to get on the soapbox for a second. Uh, we're all, for the most part, creatives here, but I just want to talk about that time in general is short and that everyone should really focus on going out there and creating something special and building something and taking what they have as their vision and putting it into practice. Take risks, go out there and explore, go travel, do all these great things. And that's my time. Thank you.